we have a few announcements as everyone is joining. Um, so first, we are recording this session and it will be available in Whova, our conference app, within two weeks for three months after the last day of the Congress. If you'd like to ask our speakers a question during the session, please use the Q&A area to the right of your screen in Whova. The chat window in Whova is also where you can engage with other attendees. And we kindly ask that you keep your microphones and cameras off during the presentations and follow the presenter's lead on when to engage with cameras and microphones on. It looks like we're ready to get started. So I'm going to hand it off to Joe to get our speakers introduced. Joe. All right, thank you very much. Hello everyone, welcome to this special session. My name is Joe Marshall. I serve as coordinator for the Oak Woodlands and Forest Fire Consortium a fire science exchange funded by the Joint Fire Science Program. This workshop will showcase the variability in U.S. oak forest ecosystems by highlighting the challenges they face with special emphasis on fire ecology and management. Presentations will cover ecosystems in the Northeast, Northwest, Central, and Southeastern U.S. Myself and Mike Stambaugh are organizers of this special session, and we're very excited for it to unfold. Um, please do note that we are hosting a fire circle after this session, after the break uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern, and all are welcome to join and further this discussion. And with that, I will hand over the screen to Dr. Dan Day, who is a research forester for the USDA Forest Service Northern Research Station located in Columbia, Missouri. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Joe, and welcome everyone. Um, I'm gonna be speaking about fire and oak ecosystems in the Lake States, Northeast, and uh, into Southeastern Canada a little bit. This is quite a bit of the Northern Research Station footprint um, in which I work. Um, I also do um, a fair amount of work in the Central Hardwood region, and you can see here, in this illustration, um, on the left is uh, is Bailey's eco regions, and you can see that uh, it's it's uh, primarily a northern hardwood um, system, um, but also the southern part of the Great Lakes in New England is falls into the central hardwood region, and and the map on the right shows the number of oak species and how they're distributed across the eastern United States. So in the southeast, in the lower Ohio and Mississippi Valley is highest concentration of oak species diversity in the eastern US. And uh, we're up in the area of lower diversity, but still, you know, four to 11 um, different oak species may occur in this region. Okay, there we go. Here's some of the more dominant oak species that occur in this area. And by far, Northern Red Oak is the most widely distributed um, oak species in this area and has the greatest distribution into Southern uh, East, Eastern Canada. Um, so you can see these, these species occur here, but they're also widely distributed across the entire Eastern um, United States. And uh, part of the reason um, for this kind of oak dominance, and, and currently today, oaks um, represent half of the eastern oak forest. And uh, this is a legacy of the history of frequent fire in the eastern United States. And here is a, a representation of historical fire frequencies from 1650 to 1850 developed by Richard Guyette and his colleagues. And uh, you can see that in the uh, area I'm speaking about that fire may have occurred on average every 12 to 20 years or, or uh, at much longer intervals up in Maine.
So in this area, there are all types of oaks, oak ecosystems um, from oak and pine barrens and glades to oak savannas, oak woodlands, oak forests, and forest types where oak are an as association of often a maybe a minor species in these systems with uh, northern hardwoods and red and white pines being the dominant cover type. And uh, this has taken a look, a regional look at the distribution of some of these types using uh, biophysical settings, classifications. And you can see that in the Western portion of this area where the tall grass prairie meets the deciduous forest, we have a concentration of oak savannas and woodlands, although that's not to say that they don't occur at finer scales throughout this area on certain sites. Um, and, uh, and you can see that in all of these systems here, oak is a component of them, even the northern hardwood, maple, beech, basswood um, unit. Um, so there's a lot of uh, variability in the spatial distribution of these different ecosystems that oak occurs in. And then at, at more local landscape scales, there are certain places on the landscape historically and currently where oak um, is more likely to occur. And, and here um, in these landscapes, you can, in the upper picture, uh, you can see that this is from uh, Southern Ontario, uh, that the trees, the ridge of trees that still have foliage on them, it is an oak dominated mixed hardwood forest. <clears throat> So ridge tops, upper slope positions. And it, it's kind of hard to find a picture of, uh, to illustrate this, but on south and west facing aspects is where you would find or would have found the more open woodlands, savannas, and, and glades in historical times. A lot of the distribution and abundance of oak is determined by site factors such as bedrock soils, topography, moisture, aspect, and most importantly, by the disturbance regime, which historically was dominated by fire. That certainly doesn't mean that it was the only disturbance. There was wind and ice, insects and diseases and drought, extreme weather events that affect the ability of oak to persist and dominate in different areas. Uh, but fire was ex extremely important amongst all of these. And it promoted, uh, during early European settlement, it was probably the most frequent of any times recently. And, and uh, the legacy of that is um, that frequent fire, along with other land use disturbances, <clears throat> promoted the expansion of oak even onto more mesic sites where there's a lot of competition and high productivity. And it's primarily on these sites uh, that we're experiencing the loss of oak in the absence of fire. <clears throat> Here's a land fire, fire regime condition class map. I'm sure you've all seen it. <laughs> you can see that just about the whole country is yellow or red, which is um, moderate to high vegetation departure from historical conditions. And in the east and in the region I'm talking about, what that means is um, we see commonly oak regeneration failures, regardless of management system or no, no management at all. Um, we are losing oak forest um, most rapidly on the more productive sites. And oak savannas and woodlands are extremely rare in this area where once, at least in the Western portion of it, they were a dominant feature on the landscape. So I'm gonna give you just a very general overview of some of the research I've been involved in. And this is not just me working alone, but um, I have a really great group of colleagues to collaborate with, and it's been a lot of fun over the years. So I'll start first with my interest in fire history to learn what we can about um, the role of fire, frequency, seasonality, intensity, in these oak systems historically, and then use that to inform the design of modern day civicultural prescriptions to sustain or restore oak ecosystems. And 
in this area. A lot of the fire history work has been done using red pine um, across the northern areas from Minnesota to Maine and uh, white pine, especially in work done by Rich Guyette in Ontario. And these snags and stumps are used to develop site-specific fire histories and then collectively with a number of sites, you can start looking at regional dynamics and fire regimes. I've worked with Bryce Hanbury to um, use GLO note survey information to reconstruct historical vegetation conditions. And we've done that in Minnesota, the state of Wisconsin illustrated here and uh, Missouri and other places. And uh, here, here's a historic, this map is a historic representation of, of different types. And you can see that the uh, Southwestern Wisconsin and Central Wisconsin is, is where the oak savannas and woodlands and oak forest dominated the landscape. But in, the, in, the abs, in this particular study, we estimated that 65% of the area in Wisconsin was some type of oak ecosystem uh, historically around 1830. And today, uh, oak systems represent only 23% of the, of the landscape. <clears throat> and oak savannas and woodlands were once 46% of the area in Wisconsin. And now they're just rare remnants and uncommon occurrences throughout the state. Um, a lot of the savannas got converted to agriculture or other land uses. And where um, that didn't occur with the absence of fires, trees filled in and, uh, and we now have a forest. And at first we would have oak forest and now they're succeeding to um, more mesic species and Greg Nowacki put out a very nice paper in 2008 on the mesification of Eastern forest systems. And that's a, that's a good reference to look at to understand some of this stuff. A lot of my work is, has been to develop civicultural systems for the um, regeneration and sustainability of oak forest. Um, uh, current conditions are often such that oak, oaks dominate in the overstory but they fail to regenerate and recruit and sustain themselves at current stocking levels uh, under today's ma management and disturbance regimes. And so we use a lot of different combinations of shelterwood harvesting or thinning, removing the midstory, using cutting herbicides. We use prescribed fire. I mean, oaks are adapted very nicely to frequent fire use and um, there is a role for fire in the regeneration and, and sustainability of oak forest. And we use artificial and natural regeneration to achieve that. Other practices that are less commonly used but have been tried are grazing with goats and, uh, and disking uh, to mechanically disturb the understory and prepare a seed bed. We also have paid a lot of attention to restoring oak savannas and woodlands in the last 10 years or more. And these are unique systems. They add a lot of diversity to the landscape. They are critical to uh, conserve the native biodiversity in ecosystems. Uh, a lot of these bats you see here and, and songbirds uh, prefer open systems, savannas and open woodlands. And, they, and uh, there's many threatened and endangered species that are, uh, prefer these types of habitats too. And, and some of the most, uh, from a plant perspective, biologically diverse systems are savannas. And that diversity just ripples through the ecosystem in terms of insects and mammals and um, the flora that lives in those types of habitats. Um, once common, now very rare. It's a increasingly common management objective to restore these systems. And we're doing a lot of research to learn how to do that in terms of sequencing and timing of different um, 
management practices involving prescribed fire, timber harvesting, thinning, grazing, mowing, mulching, all of the above. We're throwing everything at it and trying to develop many approaches using a variety of tools so the managers have options. Um, we're looking at the effects of prescribed fire on oak timber and, and forest stand value. And because we can grow a lot of valuable timber in this area, and there are some uh, reasonable concerns about fire damage and injury and loss of value to stands where we want to use frequent prescribed fire. And so working with Joe Marshall and many other people from universities and Elsewhere in the Forest Service, we've been looking at um, the effect of frequent prescribed fire on tree volume and value, on lumber volume and value, on, uh, on uh, changes in volume and value at the stand level. Uh, Mike Stambaugh is doing a lot of work looking at fire injury effects on wood properties, tree growth, um, the rates of, sc of scar closure, and, and all of um, this information is fundamental to designing civicultural systems to restore and sustain these systems um, and minimize any adverse impacts that fire can have on that value and, and volume. There's a number of um, publications that are out there. There's a lot of studies of presenting original research uh, on oak, oak forest and woodlands and savannas and in all, from all different aspects. It's overwhelming how much material is out there in the journals to try to read and consume. These are more of the synthesis type articles that I've been involved in um, that would be good references of, to get you started in thinking about how to manage these systems. And there's the Ecology and Subculture of Oak book of Oak. The third edition just came out. That's really a synthesis of literature on, on fire and oak systems in Eastern North America. A book that came out uh, led by Katie Greenberg and Bev Collins is in management of past, present, and future systems. And then there's a number of synthesis articles on different topics that I've led. Um, and one that Mary Arthur did, which is really a great paper looking at the life cycle of an oak forest and the possible roles of prescribed burning and stability of oak in those systems. And with that, I would like to conclude with this thought that uh, I encourage you to burn, burn to learn and the management and research partnerships and monitoring and research is critical to advance our understanding and our ability to restore and sustain the systems that we desire. Um, and don't wait until you know everything before you do something, burn to learn. These are fire dependent species and systems and they require fire. So with that, I'll turn it over to Joe. All right, thank you, Dan, so much. Um, the floor is open to questions if they, if um, folks want to enter those in through the OVA app, we can take those. We have about a minute and a half. <clears throat> Dan, if uh, while we're waiting to see if questions mm -hmm. come in, I'm curious about the intersection of woodland management and commercial management viability and ha have you run into examples within this region of interest where there is a intersection of commercial harvesting and also woodland management whether that be restoration or management yeah or I'm so or maintenance rather thanks yeah definitely I mean one of the complaints is from industry is with savannas and open woodlands you you definitely are carrying less volume per acre out there in the overstory. And so at some point there is less volume available and you're harvesting it perhaps on much longer rotations of 150 to 250 years or whatever. Um, but 
when you're talking about closed woodlands, there's pretty much the same amount of commercial volume in a closed woodland as a forest. And, and often it's, it's just like a forest without a mid story and with more, um, with, with less um, shade tolerant woodies in the understory. But from a commercial forestry standpoint, there's pretty much the same amount of volume. And so as long as we can learn how to use fire in those systems to minimize the injury or the impact on value and volume, um, closed woodlands can be managed uh, to achieve um, timber goals without much compromise. Great. Hey, thanks. Thank you so much, Sam, for your presentation and, and discussion. Um, with this, I'm going to hand it over to our next presenter, which is uh, Dr. He Heather Alexander, who's an assistant professor of forest and fire ecology in the School of Forestry and Wildlife Sciences at Auburn University. So welcome, Dr. Alexander. Thanks, Joe. Give me just a second here and I'll share my presentation. All right, does that look okay? It does, I think you just need to go into presenter mode. There you have it, thanks. It's good, okay, great. Well, good morning and thank you all for being here. Today I'm gonna to talk to you about some research that my colleagues and graduate students and I have been working on for the last, gosh, almost 20 years now, thinking about the role of feedbacks between trees and the, their fire environment and how different traits of different species of trees might act to either uh, promote or suppress fire. And so thinking about a, a slightly different spatial scale than what Dan was just talking about, um, thinking more at the level of the individual tree or the stand scale. So I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors first. Uh, this presentation, I've been working on many of these topics with Dr. John Willis with the Southern Research Station of the Forest Service, and then some of my previous and current graduate students, including Jennifer McDaniel, who was a master student with me and now a PhD student at the University of Georgia, Arthur Mora, who is a PhD student with me now at Auburn, and then Emily Babel Plouch, who was a master student with me at Mississippi State. And so some of the information that I'm gonna give you here at the beginning for background is similar to the information that Dan told you, but um, I'd like to just point out that, you know, oaks are a very dominant species uh, in our forest in the Eastern US and have been so since pre-settlement times. And the dominance of oaks in the Eastern US is most pronounced in the central hardwood region, which you can see by the darker grays and darker black in the map on the left. And oak forest at the time of European settlement were mostly open forests. The map on the right, you can see, this is from a paper by Bryce Hanbury, where she shows that most of the oak and oak pine forests that dominated when Europeans settled were open forests. And so they were open canopy, similar to the image that's shown on the left here, where pretty uh, low density, of trees with an open canopy and an understory that was dominated mostly by herbaceous vegetation, grasses and forbs. And so the structure is, is quite different than many of the forests that we see today in the Eastern US, which are more, more close canopied with pretty high levels of shade in the understory and really an understory dominated more by leaf litter than by live herbaceous vegetation. And these systems, as Dan pointed out, were most likely maintained by periodic low intensity fire. And so this is, I think, the, actually the same map that he showed. But you can see in the, in the eastern US, and particularly in the central hardwood region, that fires were relatively frequent. And so they were happening every four to 10 years or so. And again, these were low intensity surface fires that were fueled by that herbaceous um, vegetation that growed in the understory of those open canopy stands. And so today we still see large oaks in our forest across the eastern U.S. and oak volume continues to increase as you can see by the map on the left that was published by Fayetteville in 2011. 
and particularly in the Central Hardwood region, which is that uh, center area where it says CHR. And so pretty much anything in green shows volume increases and anything in a pink or dark magenta uh, or volume decreases. So most of the Eastern US is still showing an increase in oak volume. However, the importance value of oaks and other pyrophytic species like pines in most of the Eastern US is decreasing and the importance value of shade tolerant and, our, and or opportunistic species like uh, tulip poplar and um, well, yeah, species like tulip poplar is increasing. And so what this means is that although we have a lot of large overstory oaks, that regeneration is pretty poor. And so you might see some, you know, quite a high density of oak seedlings, but saplings and mid-story size oak trees are relatively low. And so regeneration is a problem. And this is pronounced in the central hardwood region. This is a paper that was published by Knott et al. in 2019 in Forest Ecology and Management where they divvied up the Eastern US into the different regions and they looked to see what species were increasing in importance value and what species were decreasing in importance value. And they looked at how this related to shade tolerance. And so I'm gonna point out the central hardwood region, which is in the upper right-hand corner here. And what they found is that species like oak, Quercus actually had the greatest decline in importance value since the uh, 1980s or so. And so you can see oak and uh, carius or the hickories and the pines, or and these are the pyrophytic species were the ones that were declining in importance value. And then species like red maple or the acers and uh, black gum, ash, the more shade tolerant species or more opportunistic species were the ones that were increasing in importance value. And this is a pretty common trend across the Eastern US where we, Again, see large overstory oaks, some oak seedlings, but we have that sapling and midstory bottleneck occurring, which indicates that when the overstory oaks die, that they'll likely not be replaced by oaks, they'll be replaced by other, other species. And so the shift that we're seeing, we're moving from open forests dominated by more pyrophytic oaks and pines, shifting to closed canopy forest, and this is likely due to fire suppression. So the, you know, the era of fire suppression policies in the early 1900s that, that initiated this trend, but it's probably maintained now by what we call biotic feedbacks that actually act to suppress fire. So I really like this figure that uh, Bryce Hanbury had in her, her, uh, her papers, or actually it's, this is two two parts of two figures she had in two different papers that I think illustrate the change from the open forest to closed forest and what's happening where you have increased um, fire tolerant oak and pine species in oak forest and their decline and an increase in fire sensitive tree species in closed canopy forest, which we see very commonly today. Tree density is increasing in these closed canopy forest. And there are these positive feedbacks that act in both of these different forest states that either act to promote flammable conditions in open forest or act as fire proofing feedbacks to suppress fire in these more closed canopy forests. And so my research group has been very interested in thinking about these biotic feedbacks and what is it about certain trees or tree species that contribute to either a fiery environment or a more music environment. And so our primary research objective, which I've highlighted in red on the left, is to develop a field-based empirical understanding of the direction and magnitude of biotic feedbacks at the individual tree and stands level across tree species with varying fire tolerances. And so just this year, we published a paper in bioscience that was building off the musification um, hypothesis that Nowacki and Abrams put forth in 2008, where we reviewed what we know about musification, which is that process of increasingly fire-proofing uh, characteristics of forest stands that we see happening as these shade-tolerant fire-sensitive species encroach into our previously 
open forest oak stands. And so the image on the right is just a conceptual model showing how oak trees through their individual canopy bark and leaf litter traits act to promote fire in these systems while more shade tolerant or opportunistic species tend to have characteristics that are fire suppressing characteristics. And then uh, panel C and D are showing that open forest state and panel C and the more close canopy state dominated by more fire suppressing trees in that uh, lower right hand corner. And the important part of this is that, you know, as these um, if trees have uh, different traits that either reinforce or suppress fire, over time, these traits become could become so pronounced that it's it's very difficult to either um, suppress fire or promote fire in a particular system, depending on the concentration of those different trees in the forest. And so what we're thinking is that through these individual traits over time, as these more mesophytic shade tolerant species become uh, more prolific and at higher density in these previously open forest stands, that it will be harder and harder to put fire back into those systems. So we've done quite a bit of work across the central hardwood region thinking about different traits. And we focused a lot on leaf litter because leaf litter, particularly in more closed canopy stands, is the primary fuel that will, it is the primary fuel in those systems. And so when we're restoring fire back into oak stands that haven't had fire in a while, while we're relying on that leaf litter to carry the fire. And one of the questions that we have is that if the leaf litter switches to more mesophytic leaf litter, is that actually gonna act as suppress fire and whether or not this is happening at the individual tree level. So we went out and we sampled trees of six different species, which you can see on the x-axis of this graph. And we quantified the leaf litter fuel mass that was underneath individual trees. So trees that range in size from about 20 to 60 centimeters in DBH. And we sampled at the, uh, between the bowl and the, the drip line of the tree. And a couple of things I wanna point out. So all the oak litter is in a shade of red or pink and all the hypothetical mesophytic species are in shades of blue. And what you'll notice is that most of the leaf litter in this oak dominated forest is oak litter, which makes sense, but there's a lot more oak litter underneath individual chestnut oak and white oak trees, which are the bars on the right, than there is beneath American beech, red maple, sugar maple, or hickory species. And if you look at red maple in particularly, which is like the poster child for musification, there's a lot of red maple <laughs> litter under a red maple. And this makes sense. But the point here is that if that leaf litter has fire uh, proofing qualities, then the zones of influence of those individual trees will act to reduce fire beneath those trees, which actually could serve as a mechanism to promote their persistence in these forest stands. So again, this is in a forest that's dominated by oaks, it's highly mixed, but at the individual tree level, we're seeing those individual trees influencing their understory in a way that could uh, influence fire behavior through their leaf litter. So you know, 25 to 30 percent of the leaf litter underneath red maple is red maple leaf litter. And then we saw similar things under sugar maple and American beech and hickory. And so in addition to that, that leaf litter that's occurring beneath those different species tends to decompose at different rates, which could have implications for the accumulation of fuels underneath them. So what this is showing is uh, the results of a one year decomposition bag study where we have leaf litter mass remaining beginning at 100% on the y-axis and time and months on the x-axis for seven different species. Again, the more mesophytic, hypothetical mesophytic species are in shades of blue and the oaks are in shades of red. And what you'll notice is that two of the mesophytic species, red maple and sugar maple, have the highest rates of leaf litter mass loss over time, highest rates of decomposition. So over a year, there's only about 50% of red maple and sugar maple litter remaining, while the oak species tend to have somewhere between 60 and 70 percent. The one uh, species that we were thinking was a, a mesophyte American beech was the exception to this. American beech tended to have leaf litter that decomposed uh, the slowest, actually. 
which is kind of interesting to think that there are these different mechanisms by which different tree species may influence the way the fire behaves. So, um, but in general, the more mesophytic species have leaf litter that decomposes more quickly. And this could lead to a switch um, from an oak, pure oak forest to a pure red maple, sure maple forest could decrease fuel loads by as much as 400 kilograms per hectare per year. And so not that we would ever have a pure maple forest probably in this region, but just to illustrate that the shift in species composition could have a pretty dramatic effect on the amount of fuel that we see in these stands. So different trees are influencing the zone beneath them, the amount of leaf litter that's there, as well as the rate at which that leaf litter decomposes. And then we've also done some uh, leaf litter drying experiments similar to the uh, work of Morgan Varner and Jesse Cry, thinking about how different oaks decomp uh, dry compared to uh, more mesophytic species like sweet gum and winged elm. And what we found, not unexpectedly, is that the mesophytic species tend to dry at a slower rate. So the fuel moisture content of uh, winged elm and sweet gum is much higher than of post oak or southern red oak, which is the panel on the left. And that if we do different combinations of fuels and mimic an increase in non-oak leaf litter into the fuel bed, that the more non-oak leaf litter is in the fuel bed, the slower it dries. So again, this is uh, another mechanism at which uh, by which these different species influence, could influence flammability. So they can influence the amount of fuel that's underneath them, and they can influence the uh, moisture content of those fuels. And then this is uh, just a PCA demonstrating if you pull together all the different morphological and chemical leaf traits of different species and um, see how they distribute themselves using a multivariate analysis along different axes that the oaks tend to separate out from the more mesophytic species. So again, we're using the same color scheme, uh, scheme with the oaks being in shades of red. And you can see that most of the oaks, and this is across sites in Mississippi and Kentucky, um, kind of cluster over on the right-hand side of this figure and then the non-oaks cluster toward the uh, top and the left. And this clustering can be distinguished by the different shapes of leaves. And so oaks tend to have heavier leaves with higher volume and larger, denser leaves compared to non-oaks. And those are traits that are associated with being more uh, flammable. So many other studies in different regions have looked at how different leaf traits relate to flammability and um, oaks have these leaf traits that are more flammable. So they tend to curl more, they have heavier, um, heavier and higher volume leaves and those make the fuel bed more flammable. So we've done some small scale experimental studies out in the field where we've manipulated fuel beds to see how that influences fire behavior. And what we did is we had, a, if we have a fuel bed of mostly oak or mesophytic litter and then we ignite it and measure uh, flammability metrics like rate of spread and flame height we can see that oak beds, which is in the top right here, they burn easily and consumption rates were high. But then if we have a fuel bed that's dominated by, for example, winged elm leaf litter, which is a um, very prolific species in the Southeast, that only that right-hand side of that graph burned. And so we've done quite a few of these studies with different species and there is a decrease in flammability associated with changes in species composition as you move from more uh, oak species to non-oaks like sweet gum and winged elm, which are the two species shown on the far right here. And then more recently, we've been doing some work where we've added pine into these mixtures because we've noticed in some of our stands that having just a little bit of pine litter in the fuel bed changes flammability quite dramatically. And so these are data from um, a site in uh, northern Mississippi, which is just on the edge of the central hardwood region, where we change the amount of pine in the fuel bed compared to southern red oak and sweet gum. And pretty consistently, as you move away from having pine in the stand, which kind of makes sense, you get, uh, you get cooler temperatures with the fires and you have uh, lower 
rates of spread and, and lower rates of consumption. And sweet gum, which is like the poster child for musification as you go fat further south, simply does not burn. <laughs> so we also are growing seedlings in these stands to see how, um, how they respond to these different fires. And so we're interested to see um, how fuel beds influence tree regeneration. All right, so in summary. I'm sorry, Heather. Yes. I do need to um, encourage us to move to the next presentation at this point. We've, we've hit that time of okay. the um, session. Sure, okay, I'll just, uh, that's my last slide. Oh, perfect. <laughs> sorry about that. No, it's great. Well, thank you so much. Sure. And um, I'll remind folks that we will be hosting a fire uh, circle session after this where we can further these discussions. And with that, I will hand the screen over to Dr. Morgan Barner, Director of Research and Senior Scientist at Tall Timbers in Tallahassee, Florida. And um, as we're all becoming more familiar, Program Chair of this conference. Thanks, Welcome. Joe. You hear me okay? Yes, sir. Very well. Um, well, I'll just, I'm just going to continue what Heather was talking about, Heather. This is a great plan. She was going to go till exactly 20 minutes, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to keep on going with it. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'll, I'm, I'll move a little bit farther south than Heather was, uh, and, and we'll focus on the southeastern um, oaks and really focus on traits, so following her lead on that. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of my co-authors, you can see there. Um, and I'll, I'll say, um, when I was asked to do this, and it was over text message with Mike, um, I said, no, I'm not going to, I don't want to talk about this. And he and I went back and forth several times. It ended with all caps, um, him uh, making me do this. And I'll tell you a little bit about why, why that is, uh, and maybe it'll be uh, um, obvious to you. Uh, but Keeping with this theme here, the role of fire across U.S. oak forest ecosystems, um, and particularly the latter half of that, sharing varied ecologies to real, realize unifying themes. And the unifying themes is what I'm going to try to focus on um, and, and really go through a little bit about the southeastern oak ecosystems and fire. Uh, I'm going to focus uh, much like Heather did on trade analyses and then hopefully chart some sort of future might, where we might all that is all the presenters in this session uh, might think about synthesizing. Um, the reason that I was so uh, hesitant to do this, um, I've spent about half my career working in Western oak ecosystems and the other half working in Southeastern pine systems, but also oak ecosystems, um, because there's a problem here from a, um, telling a simple story. The Southeast has the highest diversity of oaks in the US. Um, and certainly as a tr in tree form oaks. Um, it also has the greatest frequency of fire. Um, and as uh, Mike and um, their team has focused with PC2FM, it's also really diverse the more you zoom in. Um, so it's a great diversity of, of species combined with um, a relatively complex palette of fire, soil, et cetera. Um, so it becomes a difficult story and it's hard to, hard to come up with, um, with Clear themes. I'm going to do. I'm going to go at this in a couple different ways. One of those is to look at, just as Heather was talking about, to look at um, one trait in particular, and that is litter flammability. And I'm going to break it up into um, this number of ecosystems here that that span this portion of the southeast. Um, to look at Appalachian species, to look at oak hickory species and to look at the southeastern, uh, I'm calling coastal plain uplands, but could be pine oak uplands, and then the embedded bottomlands that occur through here. There are lots of other ways um, that you could classify southeastern oak ecosystems, um, but this is just the way I'm going to do it here. Um, like I said, they're, they're really diverse. This, this image here could be about 50 different, um, depending on the, um, the ecosystem taxonomist, the classifier, uh, with very different um, oak ecosystems. I'm just going to focus on these um, with litter collected across this region um, and in systems where oaks play a dominant role. And acknowledging first that litter flammability um, is just one of many fire adapted traits, but it's certainly one of the ways that oaks persist in these landscapes. Um, oaks tend to make these ecosystems more flammable. 
their litter is pretty well known to be um, quite flammable in these in these systems. But there are also other traits. Um, the patterns of bark accumulation on the on the bowls of oaks is tremendously variable. Um, using saying oak uh, is really inadequate and often pretty confusing and misleading because uh, oaks are very different and certainly they show these strong differences in the southeast. Bark is one of those areas they do that quite well. Um, all tend to sprout vigorously following fire pretty well, um, but that also can be more complicated than a simple image here of a, a little uh, turkey oak resprouting. Um, and they also show pretty strong differences in their wound closure. So when they do suffer an injury um, that does make it across um, the bark into the, into the underlying cambium, they have really diverse ways in which they close wound and then move on in a growth standpoint. So what I'm gonna do, um, this is from this paper we published a couple months ago, is talk about those four general um, ecosystems. Again, they're just, it's coarse, but I, th I think it'll be illustrative. Um, and talk a little bit about the fire regimes of these. And for every one of the fire regimes, like here, this fire return interval, there's a little tilde for a reason. Um, oak ecosystems in general have been neglected by the fire history community for some good reasons. Um, but uh, for a lot of these, we have a pretty poor understanding of what those, what those fire regimes were prior to colonization. Um, and what we get a lot of hints from is how they respond to contemporary fire. So I'm gonna be off on several of these. Uh, I apologize in advance. Um, so what I'm going to do in this white box here is I'm going to show uh, a few ordinations, um, again, following how Heather just presented. And in them, it'll, there'll be principal components analyses, and you'll see uh, individual species dotting over this white space. And in general, uh, you know, you can pay most attention to this horizontal axis that will be a, the primary axis for these data. Um, these are from lab flammability studies that, you know, our group has done um, what seems like dozens of now, but we've been working on it for about 15 years, um, and hopefully it'll be um, provocative. Um, and so this one, what will happen is on the right side, as all of the subsequent ones will have, it'll have a greater flame height, uh, more fuel consumption, and because these are, these fall into that fast flammable um, descriptor, they'll have shorter flame duration, and the opposite side of the axis will be the opposite. And in this case, the, the um, north-south, the vertical axis will be protracted smoldering. If you're looking for the cheat sheet, the right side of this box will be the most flammable. And this is what they're all gonna look like. Um, they're color shaded for the fire line intensity that's calculated from those measures. But in general here, if you look at the right side, again, the most flammable side for the oak hickory systems, you see a big cluster here of a lot of oaks. Um, you can see Southern red oak, uh, scarlet oak, chestnut oak, Northern red oak, and white oak. Um, you see this other cluster here that has uh, hickories and a few others. Uh, you also see that it's they're relatively uh, equivalent to shortleaf pine, a well-known really flammable pine. And then that same uh, odd observation that Heather just shared about um, a number, another member of the oak family, Fagus grandifolia, American beech, sits here. And the other member of this family, uh, Castadia dentata, American chestnut, the functionally extinct member, um, you see it being the most flammable at the right at the right end of this of this um, of this plot, and then the species that she mentioned. She mentioned the poster child for mesification, uh, Acer rubrum, red maple. There's the liquid ambar styrofoam sweet gum that she mentioned, um, uh, black gum, etc. All sitting in this really non-flammable um, uh, cluster. We move to the Appalachian forest. Here's a. This should be a. You know, it's. You see it goes from five to 25, five times larger in this, in this uh, range. The work that Mike, Joe, uh, Charles Lafon, and others all suggest that um, we really don't know what Appalachian uh, oak forest uh, fire regimes probably were. Uh, There's a lot of work to be done. But again, in the same case, you see on this right side, the most flammable section, there's scarlet oak, there's white oak. You see it occurring with two well-known flammable pines. And then there's Castania dentata again, the American chestnut. And other species sitting over here, there's red maple, there's black gum, uh, the same group of mesophytes and American basswood that frequently shows up. And Pinostrobus, eastern white pine. So just like with the oaks, you can't say all oaks are flammable. You certainly can't say that with pines either. 
in the pine oak uplands that may have a something uh, that looks like a longleaf pine or ponderosa pine uh, fire regime really, really frequent. Um, and with those species, they tend to have great representation over here to the right, where you see lots of southeastern oaks um, mixing in with a couple of other unexpected species. Uh, and then I think most provocative in this is seeing in the least flammable group two oaks, uh, the live oaks, true live oak and sand live oak occurring with um, with uh, uh, sand pine, the, the Serotonus uh, peninsular sand pine, um, occurring in this really non-flammable group. So emphasizing that point that we often find ourselves in, and I know that um, Greg Nowacki and others have talked about, we don't mean all oaks are flammable. We don't mean all oaks are pyrophytic. Um, and I think the, these two species really um, bring that point home. In the bottomlands, um, you know, what is what in the world is this little fire regime over here? There's a lot of recent work that, that suggests that fire moved into these systems much more. Um, on our own property at Tall Timbers, we uh, frequently fires will spread into uh, the bottomlands and burn up to the, the edge of the water. Um, we're starting to just understand a little bit more about these systems, but fire and forested wetlands have always been a, an area that uh, fire ecologists have avoided, unfortunately. But in the same way, if you look at the species here, you see there's Vegas grandifolia, that odd one. Uh, you see white oak, uh, swamp chestnut oak, all sitting on this flammable side, along with the other species that tend to occur. A group that is really nice here of uh, mesophytes, there's red maple again, a couple of oaks, both willow oak and water oak, occurring with these this really classical group of mesophytes. Um, and then there's a live oak again occurring with, um, with bald cypress. So a really nice segregation of the individual species that occur there with oaks leading the way in a, from a flammability standpoint. These trade analyses that, that Heather touched on, and I hope um, this whole session gets to, um, have been done for a long time, for decades. Um, they've primarily been focused on pines um, for lots of different reasons. We haven't done very much with oak ecosystems for some reasons, just lacking data. And the other part is the sort of slow understanding that we've had. It's really emerged over the last two or three decades about the role of fire in oaks. We've known that oaks have been fire prone for a long time, um, but that general recognition by the scientific community has been, uh, has lagged. So there's a lot of different ways, there are a lot of different ways to look at these fire trait analyses. And I wanna give you a couple examples briefly. We looked at some of the Southeastern coastal plain oaks and looked at their individual um, traits and how they were related um, and included physiological traits, but also um, some of these, what really would be considered classical fire adapted traits. So if we look here at the top right, uh, here's litter flame height and uh, sapling bark thickness. It shows really clearly those species that burn with great intensity have to protect themselves. And so they invest heavily in, in sapling bark and saplings being the area to look because those are the most sensitive to fire injury. Likewise, if we look here at flame height and seedling relative growth rates, we see this really dramatic trade-off here that those that burn with great intensity have really low growth or slow growth. And those that um, balance that growth versus versus um, offense in this case uh, that we know is related to defense here, you see that real nice trade-off. And here you see them directly, uh, a photosynthetic um, estimate of carbon, uh, CO2 assimilation rate being opposite of, of uh, bark thickness. And then similarly here with the evergreenness as measured by a canopy duration. So 365 days means you're uh, your evergreen, you can see those species lined up there at 365, and then those that are much more deciduous, um, burning with much greater flame height. There are a lot of ways to look at it. We took individual measures like these and uh, used a classification for the species in the, in the southeastern coastal plain and categorized them as pyrophytes, mesophytes, and then that group of the live oaks that we categorized as avoiders. There's a, there's a lot of room for something like this with oaks in North America and, and uh, specifically with oaks in the, um, in the Southeast more broadly. We tried a little bit um, for this, this talk to be able to give an example of that that goes a little bit farther. Um, we just published a paper that when I was talking about earlier um, a couple months ago that looks at a lot of different Southeastern species. 
and we use the classic uh, Jackson et al. 1999 paper. Uh, if you haven't read it, uh, you must. Um, where they look at bark in a lot of different ways, we combine these two data sets of litter flammability and bark accumulation, and again, used an ordination technique. So this, um, this principal components will have that same sort of view. It'll be mostly flammable to the right, uh, less flammable at the left. If we were in person, I could ask you to tell me where those species that I just talked about would show up, uh, but because we're virtual, I'll just show you. Um, the species that are sitting in this right hand side um, are those oaks I've just repeatedly mentioned in those individual communities. Scarlet oak, white oak, northern red, chestnut, swamp chestnut, southern red, uh, the great uh, post oak, turkey oak, blackjack oak are all sitting here almost lined up on this really flammable end that are positively related to flame height and the percent consumed. And you see how tightly those two metrics are related um, in opposition here to uh, those that burn slowly, and that's the, the evergreen uh, live oak, uh, the bottomland, and often upland uh, mesophyte, water oak, and laurel oak, all sitting here on this other end. Um, and then the, the bark thickness is um, not running true north to south, but the species sitting in the bottom here with the most rapid juvenile bark accumulation is blue jack oak, post turkey, and, uh, and black, uh, black jack oak. And you see these other species that are all sitting here that rarely invest um, invest very much in that fire sensitive phase of, uh, of being a juvenile. So this is a cool way to look at the species. And uh, because this is across a large area, you can take species that rarely would co-occur like these two here uh, or these two here. Um, they don't overlap in, in space and be able to see that they're, they're providing a very similar function uh, as these functional traits reflect. So to close, um, we know these ecosystems are of high species diversity, and particularly with oaks, they have really variable fire regimes. Um, these trade analyses are pretty promising, um, but we have a need for a lot of other data. Um, we don't have wall-to-wall uh, -wall coverage in any of these, and so anytime we do those analyses, we're constrained by the number of species and the number of traits. And so um, I'd encourage us all to get to work uh, to look at this better. And with that, I'll, I'll close, Joe. Okay, thank you so much. Um, there is several minutes here for questions. If folks have them, I invite you to um, either type those into the question and answer in HOVA, or if you do have the capacity to um, ask on your mic um, to go for it. As those uh, come in, I do, I don't have a really, this isn't perfectly thought out, but I recall these, um, oh wait, more, uh, Dan Day asks, what about dynamics of mixed litter? Yeah, we've done, you know, Heather had a really nice um, presentation that we've done quite a bit of that. We know that individual species, um, play disproportionate effects, red maple being the, again, the poster child, it really tends to affect drying and it also affects um, flammability. It's kind of an exciting thing, you know, for all of these, the lab stuff is always an abstraction. We know it, we acknowledge it. Uh, and as we move to like Heather showed with those small plots of mixed species, uh, you start to get closer and closer to reality and mixing species is really exciting. And that, that one figure that she showed that had the six species and the proportion beneath the drip line, I think is really provocative. I had a question. Yeah, shoot, man. Can you hear me? Yep. Hey, um, lo love the ordinations. Um, and I just had a question. So how are those uh, species clusters as represented as polygons, how are those determined um, in the PCA analysis? <clears throat> I'm sorry, I did, you broke up a little bit. Yeah, the species clusters as represented by the polygons, I was just curious how those were determined uh, in the PCA analysis. Oh yeah, so sorry. Uh, we use clustering procedures and for each of them, um, if you noticed, if for those who, are, who know the Southeastern species really well, species pop in and out differentially and it's upsetting. And so you can constrain the number of clusters um, and 
you can also expand the number of clusters and there's a, there's always a balancing when you're doing uh, that clustering. And so our, where we settled um, is when you have that number, that many species and that few traits, uh, it's always frustrating. And so we end up where you, um, I'll, I'll move my cursor to a species and then try to avoid moving it to another that will pop in. You'll see sweet gum pop in sometimes and it's really upsetting. That's what the data say, and that's the best the best of the clustering fits, um, but it can be really frustrating. Cool. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks to everyone. Um, I'll remind you that we do have a fire circle um, focus on this topic so we can further these discussions then. And with that, I will move on to our next presenter, who is Dr. Eric Knapp, research ecologist with the U.S. Forest Service Pacific Southwest Research Station. Well, good morning, everyone, or afternoon, wherever you may be. Uh, we're we're going to move west for this talk. Um, and so I just like wanted to acknowledge my um, co-authors on this, Michelle Coppoletta, Natalie Polakowski, and Alan Taylor. And so let's see. I'm having an issue advancing. There we go. Um, Okay, so uh, black oak, I see you have black oak also uh, in the east, but the black oak we're talking about in the west here, and I'm gonna be focused on my, of my talk is Quercus calagii. It's an important species of the lower to middle elevation uh, mixed hardwood conifer forest uh, in California. Uh, it's mostly a California endemic, but it also goes up into uh, Southwestern Oregon. And, the, the acorns of the species were a, were a preferred tribal uh, food source. So there's a long history of tribal management of uh, black oak forest, both to um, accentuate the species, but also to kill uh, acorn weevils to aid in the harvest of acorns. Uh, but in the, in the absence of fire, a, a lot of these oaks uh, become overtopped by the taller statured conifers and eventually are sh shaded out. And you can see the picture here from the Shasta Trinity National Forest. I think you can make out some of the stems, a number of them, th these are all the oaks, uh, but they've been uh, encroached by, in this case, Douglas fir, and then eventually overtopped, shaded out. And so there's a lot of interest uh, in California in restoring the black oak component um, for many reasons. You know, the tribal interest, the, the fact that um, black oak uh, is, is kind of a keystone wildlife species and also for just general um, biodiversity uh, of the forest. So to, to best understand how to, how to restore uh, the species, obviously we, we really need to understand the, the, um, the fire regimes that would most benefit black oak. And so the questions that I wanted to get at with this talk are, the extent to which frequent fire is critical for the long-term persistence of black oak in these mixed hardwood conifer forests. And secondly, uh, what is the potential impact of changing fire regimes, including increasing fire severity that we're seeing uh, in the West on black oak? And so in general, it's uh, thought that black oak stems may be more fire sensitive than many conifers. I don't feel like that, that data is, is um, too definitive at this point, but black oaks have what's considered moderate bark thickness, especially some of these bigger individuals, uh, like you see on the, on this this massive oak on the right, uh, have fairly thick bark, but it's it's probably not quite as thick as species like ponderosa pine. Um, and then, as with a lot of other oaks, a high severity fire uh, does favor resprouting species, and and this oak is a prolific resprouter. So uh, the work I'm going to uh, talk about today, it uh, took place in the Ishi Wilderness, which is on the Lassen National Forest in sort of north central California. And uh, Ishi Wilderness is named after Ishi, who was a member of the Yahi tribe and lived in this landscape undetected until 1911. Uh, and so this is a really remote country, and there, uh, if you, there's, a, there's a major deer, um, salmon stream, Deer Creek, flowing in the canyon here and above the, the Deer Creek are several plateaus and they're called pineries. Um, so I'll, I'll be focusing my talk on the, this Beaver Creek pinery and then secondly, the Graham pinery. 
And incidentally, uh, these two pineries experienced different fires and they experienced uh, different severities of fires over time. So the Beaver Creek Pinery, uh, we've uh, for some time used as a reference stand for old growth ponderosa pine, black oak forest with uh, fires created spatial heterogeneity. It's obviously never been logged. Uh, and it has that classic group and gap structure brought about by um, you know, numerous past fires. And what differentiates this area from a lot of other areas in California is uh, the, the fire suppression has been quite effective in, in most areas of California, but because of this remoteness of the Ishii wilderness, the pinery actually burned uh, four times in the 20th century. 1901, 1924, and then there's a gap, and then two recent fires, 1990 and 1994. Some work that Alan Taylor did in the uh, in the past uh, showed that more widespread fires occurred on the interval of every five years. So the really frequent fire in this landscape, and and you can see some of the variability from the pictures here. Uh, classic groups. Uh, areas of, of regeneration of conifers. You also have pockets where there's there's a, a lot of black oak and black oak mixed with uh, pines and areas where uh, fire severity was maybe a little bit uh, more intense in those 1990 and 1994 fires. It's a very interesting landscape. So my predecessors at PSW, they went up there in the late 1990s and put in a bunch of plots on top of this plateau on a 100 meter grid and took data on a tree, sapling and seedlings in 1998, uh, which we then got a joint fire science grant and repeated in 2016. Uh, the panel on the left here is a 1989 reconstruction. So right before the two most recent fires in 1990 and 1994, and, and, uh, and then the um, size class distribution on the, on the X axis. And I know that's pretty small, but these are the smaller trees on the left couldn't reconstruct the seedlings very well, but you can see that um, there, there was an abundance of, of um, you know, smaller to intermediate sized stems in, in this landscape, which uh, the second panel is 1998 after the two fires. So those two fires essentially uh, took out um, some of this probably uh, ingrowth that had occurred uh, during the 60 plus years without fire and essentially restored the structure to what we believe the, it was likely um, look like with frequent fire. And then by the time we got to 2016, you, you see this massive influx of small to uh, medium sized trees, particularly ponderosa pine. And when you, when you, when you look at this, data numerically, you can see ponderosa pine increased from 70 odd trees per acre in 1998 to 188 or 166 percent increase. Black oak increased 14 uh, percent. The basal area of ponderosa pine increased 28 percent over that time. Black oak was essentially flat uh, and both species regenerated very prolifically, but ponderosa pine more so than, than black oak. So uh, th this was kind of a, a little bit of a surprise to us. I mean, we expected oh, two frequent fires. We know oaks are, are um, fire dependent species. Uh, we expected there may be more, a little more of a bump in uh, black oak because of these frequent fires. But when, when you walk through this area, you could see that you know, it's just prolific ponderosa pine regeneration. And these are really productive systems with heavy winter rainfall. And so there's, there's lots of opportunities for, for regeneration. In the absence of fire, uh, these, these forests, the openings, they fill with trees. Here's Carl Skinner standing in a sea of uh, ponderosa pine in 2005. And then um, another patch in 2018, you can see that the pines are becoming bigger. So you know, for the for the first question I, I asked is is frequent fire critical for long term persistence of black oak in, in these mixed stands? And I think the answer is is definitely yes. I mean the 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 role that fire played in here was probably to just to keep the conifer regeneration at bay so that two species with different statures could could coexist. So um, just to give you a little more sense of of other changes that have accompanied uh, 
the the forest changes, uh, just pointing out of the some other attributes of these stands over time. It's a picture in 1996, and then a repeat picture in 2016. You can see some of the same stems, uh, but you look at the understory, it looks, looks very different today. So grasses in 1998 went from 33% cover down to 3%. Uh, shrubs went from 16.5% a cover to 31%. You can see this really proliferation of shrubs. Trees uh, increased substantially, and a lot of that is this ingrowth of ponderosa pine. Litter increased, coarse woody debris also increased as many of the, the um, bowls of trees killed in those 1990-1994 fires fell to the ground. So uh, next I'm going to take you to the Graham Pinery uh, and this is a this area has a higher black oak abundance and lower ponderosa pine uh, than the Beaver Creek Pinery. Incidentally uh, as if you didn't pull out from the from the previous slide it's about the Beaver Creek Pinery was about 90 percent uh, ponderosa pine, about 10% black oak. Uh, the situation is, is a bit reversed here. And a lot of that has to do with um, a fire in the 1930s, which must have been a higher severity fire. Uh, it, it probably removed a lot of the pines that were here at that time. And a lot of these stems seem to be uh, re-sprouts from that 1930s fire. So uh, for the sake of the talk, we're gonna we're gonna call this the Graham Oakery because that really defines uh, it describes it a little bit better than the than the pinery. Uh, it last burned in 1931. Um, then 1990, it saw the same fire as, as the Beaver Creek Pinery. It didn't see the 1994 fire, but then it burned in 2014 in January, which was just mind blowing because in California, uh, we get a lot of rain in the winter and typically we don't have wildfires in January. It's way too moist, but that might portend, you know, fire regimes of the future with warmer and drier uh, conditions and just a delayed onset to our to our rainy season. So, but but that 2014 fire, uh, just because it occurred in cooler conditions, it was there was probably some moisture um, available. It in in many ways was probably more like your typical maybe hotter end prescribed fire. Than your typical summer wildfire. So our objective um, with going in here and, and, and evaluating the, the structure of the stand after that 2014 fire was to, was to learn more about what type of fire might best maintain this heterogeneous mix of black oak and ponderosa pine. And so what we, we installed uh, 22 random plots in this landscape using the same procedures we did in the Beaver Creek Pinery. And the, the graph on the left here give you uh, uh, the pre-fire structure. Uh, and you can see that now that the situation is reversed, yeah, ponderosa pine is in the minority, black oak in the majority. So this is pre-fire structure. A lot of these were sapling size classes, seedlings, uh, small trees and large trees. And then after the wildfire, um, the this is what the, the uh, stand the struck the stands look like and you can see this the fires essentially removed all of the seedlings and quite a few of the saplings and even some of the smaller trees and if you look at the relative um, mortality of stems uh, you can see that the, the seedlings completely removed but the percent the difference the, the between the two species ponderosa pine and um, black oak is not much so Fire doesn't really favor one species so much over the other um, in terms of stems. So just to uh, conclude, um, you know, it's oftentimes written that black oak depends on high severity fire. And that might be the case if, for um, for example, a, a stand of pure black oak, you can you can you can create a pure black oak stand with a past high severity fire that takes out the conifers. But for these mixed black oak and conifer systems, it's a little bit more complex. Um, so in these in these mixed systems, 
uh, I think they really depend on frequent fire to keep regen conifer regeneration in check. And we saw that in the, in the Beaver Creek Pinery. So, and, and sure, um, high severity fire might favor resprouting species like black oak, but to actually restore a forest with mature stems of mixed hardwoods and conifers requires lower severity fire and probably many cycles of lower severity fire. And unfortunately, in, in our part of the world, this combination of frequent and lower severity fire is currently quite rare. Uh, this is not the kind of fire we see, and a lot of that has to do with fire suppression. Uh, we tend to suppress uh, most of the types of fires that probably would benefit black oak the best. If it's you know, lower intensity fires are easy to put out, so we put them out. And so what a lot of these uh, landscapes are experiencing is wildfires that escape initial attack under the most extreme conditions. And those kind of fires uh, tend to top kill the, both the black oak and the ponderosa pine in this case. And we're not replacing th that um, the fires we're suppressing with indigenous fire or prescribed fire. Uh, so the, the future to me for black oak uh, without a change in the fire regime looks more like the pictures below with a lot of black oak Resprouts and maybe not a black oak forest. And so um, I'm just going to wrap up by uh, plugging a website. And this is a really fascinating landscape. If any of you are interested, uh, a website that uh, Alan Taylor and his Penn State group put together. Uh, we we lugged a 360 degree camera up to the top of the Beaver Creek Pinery Plateau and uh, took a bunch of pictures at different points in the canopy with a large tripod. And these are really high resolution pictures and it really gives you a sense of what this pinery looks like. So I just encourage you to visit this uh, website. Um, just, just search Ishii and, and Wildfire and, and you'll come up with it. And with that, I will uh, conclude my presentation. All right, great, thank you so much. Uh, I encourage folks to either type questions if they come up into the um, question and answer section on HOVA or to unmute your mics if you're comfortable and ask away. And if there's no questions, I, I would be happy to quickly share a, a shot from that website. Are there any questions? I haven't seen any come in yet. Okay, well then I will, I will um, show you uh, this website and so you can click on to you know here, here are all the points that we took uh, pictures the three, 360 pictures of in the pinery and then you can uh, click on to any of these and with high resolution imagery kind of get a sense of this forest you can see the ponderosa pine groups black oaks um, and there's another nice black oak uh, so it's, uh, it, it provides a pretty cool look. And I know probably on your screen, it doesn't look as good over Zoom as it does uh, when, when you look at it on your computer. So anyway, I'll stop the share. It, it looked pretty good on my screen. That, okay, cool. Uh, that felt like I was there for a second. Thanks. <laughs> um, we did have one question come in about um, if you have any comment about what regeneration from seed or acorn and I guess I would tack on to that I'm curious about like for the beaver creek changes you saw what influence you think episodic masting might have played there uh, was it a big big year for pine seed uh in you know ponderosa pine tends to go it's cyclical it has it, it and Probably about every three or four years, there's a big ponderosa pine year, uh, but there, there tends to be a lot of ponderosa pine seed around. And when you have a condition where you have abundant winter rainfall and productive soils, we tend to get some amount of regeneration just about every year. It, it's uh, so I think in, in our system, it's it's fire that really kind of keeps this keeps that in check. Do you have any sense at those sites what percentage or, or what contribution, relative contribution acorns had versus um, sprouting? 
Well, we, we, we did take data on uh, regeneration of both species. And you saw that there was, um, there was abundant number of small uh, seedlings of oaks and, um, and ponderosa pine. Uh, but the, the, the oaks from acorns, they get established fairly slow too, and uh, they pretty readily get overtopped by uh, the, the, the ponderosa pine. So I think it's probably frequent fire that eventually allowed the, the, the oaks to, uh, to predominate over, over the pines. And there's definitely a lot of, there's, there's a lot of um, young, trees on, on the forest floor. Uh, you just don't see them in the canopy. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much. We're gonna close this part out and move on to our next presenter, um, who is Dr. Rosemary Sheriff, a professor at Humboldt State University. And so with that, I will hand over the screen. Thanks. Can you see my screen fine? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Well, this is great to be part of this session, and um, I, I uh, appreciate going after Eric. I'm also talking about conifers in the um, West. So let me just do something right here. Okay. So um, I, before I begin, I just want to acknowledge that the land where I live, where I'm sitting at Humboldt State University, and um, many of the locations that I'm going to mention in this talk sit on unceded traditional ancestral and present homelands of indigenous nations and peoples, many uh, different tribes, uh, more than are listed on this slide. So I want to start out and sort of framing, uh, like many of the other talks, where, where we're talking about. Uh, Oregon white oak has a distribution from southern British Columbia down through uh, central California, and then even a small pocket over into central so, uh, the central uh, southern Sierras here. Along with that, the climate uh, regime, one of the things you can notice is that the oak woodlands, the white oak woodlands are distributed not necessarily right along the coast um, for the most part, and which is, has the heaviest uh, amount of annual precipitation, but it does occur in areas that have relatively high precipitation. And, um, as you would expect, there is decreasing annual precipitation as you move into the southern distribution. Also, this is just a map of uh, summer maximum temperature. And what we see is that there's a predictable decrease, um, uh, or excuse me, increase of summer temperature as you move into the southern distribution. So that just gives some sort of context. And later on in the talk, I'm going to focus a little in Northern California in this area that does have a high gradient of both temperature and precipitation through its distribution. So I'm gonna today give like a really pretty quick landscape overview instead of the setting of um, recent research. And so just really hitting the surface of a lot of important um, research. Uh, but first let's look at an example of a uh, oak woodland system. And one of the things you can see is there's varied structure. In addition to that, on the left side, you can see that there, uh, it, the oak woodlands, and this is through, true throughout many of the oak woodlands throughout the distribution of white oak, uh, Oregon white oak, is that it's intermixed within a conifer uh, dominated landscape as well. Historically, uh, traditional uh, burning would have occurred relatively frequently. We know this from records throughout the distribution and with the extirpation of native people, as well as their indigenous burning practices, as Eric was mentioning, along with fire suppression and uh, Euro-American settlement land use changes, such as uh, sheep grazing and so on, significantly sh shifted um, Oregon white oak ecosystems. Uh, and just sort of some context that I think you're mostly familiar with, but important for context. Research throughout the distribution and studies have shown that conifers have, native conifers in particular, Douglas fir, have had a big impact in terms of encroaching into these native oak woodland ecosystems. Um, and here's just a couple of examples of that. And that has led to a significant amount of decline in many of our oak uh, oak ecosystems, so both uh, thinking about oak vigor, the canopy structure, as well as mortality. 
Oak woodlands are also known to have incredible diversity in both in terms of understory, um, mixed species, uh, a, a variety of uh, tree species, but also other biota supporting, you know, high proportions of bird and other um, organisms. And so with encroachment, that's significantly impacting both habitat, but also the, the biodiversity, um, and as well as traditional ecological resources sources and values. So very important uh, ecosystems for a lot of reasons. Um, now, I know this is an incredibly important topic and particularly for this meeting, um, and I'm gonna hit this pretty quickly um, and, and highlight a, a talk tomorrow. Um, we know also from recent studies, although there's more nuance that always needs to be done, is that uh, encroachment and, and, um, and uh, changes in stand structure also alter fuel structure, fuel moisture, and uh, micrometeorology. So I just want to highlight, because I am going to hit that pretty quickly and focus on um, other aspects. Jeff Kane is presenting tomorrow on Friday, and it is from an Oak Woodland stand, uh, looking at these contexts in, that I'll be talking about today. We, there's a number of us that studied um, some of these systems in Northern California. And in addition to sort of those general trends that are widespread across oak ecosystems, and I just reviewed that very briefly, one of the things I also want to highlight is there's a lot of variability in encroachment conditions. And that's true across the distribution of Oregon white oak land, uh, woodlands, but also within stands, there's quite a bit of variability. So understanding the changes in understory and diversity and altered strand structures and fuel moisture and so on are very important and we need to understand it in context of the variability of stand con conditions and encroachment. Studies also show that thinning and the reintroduction of fire and prescribed fire in particular and indigenous burning are very important and they um, have uh, positive effects of, of restoring more open conditions in oak woodlands with some caveats. So those um, studies are very important in, in highlighting that the importance of this, but also that it, it is difficult to uh, remove Douglas fir and other conifers, for example, really resistant to, to mortality from fire after a certain stage, uh, prolific regeneration of conifers in particular in this ecosystem, Douglas fir, uh, the expansion of non-native uh, understory and grasses can be a major problem. So Restoration of oak woodlands and thinning and the reintroduction of fire is critical. We also know that for traditional ecological services and values, but there are some nuanced um, importance of understanding some of the sort of negative consequences of trying to do uh, management actions. So for the remaining portion of my time, uh, I was gonna highlight what uh, some of the work that I and others have been doing in Northern California. So this sort of more Southern distribution, not the exact Southern, but, but close and a, a gradient of uh, higher to lower moisture um, and, and higher temperatures towards the Southern distribution. This is also a map on the left-hand side of the distribution of white Oregon white oak in white here. And I highlight this um, just to emphasize, um, Eric Knapp was just talking about black oak and here you can see the two, the distributions of both species. So uh, black oak in uh, the black color, uh, white oak in white. And the study that I'm gonna focus on next, we sampled 10 sites in this area here, which represent uh, northern areas of um, Humboldt County down to Mendocino County, roughly a little less than 300 miles north-south tra transect, um, and predominantly in white oak, but we do have a little bit of black oak in these ecosystems. So our goal in this study um, was really to understand, you know, a more nuance of what the age and stand structure conditions. We know encroachment's happening. We can see it on the landscape. It's been documented in other uh, states. Um, but what we took is a network of both private and public lands and identified areas that were predominantly oak woodlands, but adjacent to conifer and native conifer um, ecosystems as well. So I'm gonna hit some highlights of some of the findings we found from this study. Um, 
This is uh, just to highlight some of our sampling protocol briefly. This is one site. Um, this is the site also that Jeff Kane was, will be talking about tomorrow, and I'll highlight some examples work subsequently that we've done at this particular site as well. At each one of these 10 sites throughout uh, the last map that I showed, we randomly located nine plots within each one of those sites and identified areas that had high encroachment of uh, Douglas fir in particular, moderate, that's really a, you know, a mix of a wide variety of uh, stand conditions, and then low to no encroachment. Um, we have across these 10 sites about 1,800 tree ages from coring trees. We've looked at stand structure and regeneration, and I'm just going to focus today in looking at the overall uh, tree ages. So when has encroachment occurred and what is the predominant uh, uh, you know, uh, differences in age and stand structure across these gradient in Northern California? This is the age structure from that one site that I just showed. Um, and what we find, and this is consistent across the 10 sites that we sampled, is that the oaks really date from the late 1800s to the early 1900s with the lack of fire. After that point, we begin to see Douglas fir coming in. Uh, and in particular, we see high amounts of Douglas fir, which is in red, uh, coming in into the latter portion of the 1900s. And we tend to see um, this pattern across all 10 sites. So for example, it's very consistent uh, in which that we see white is representing as um, Oregon white oak, black is representing as black oak, uh, and then red representing Douglas fir, and then a little bit about other species here. 80% across all 10 sites of our oak established uh, between 1850 and 1910. So that's really a high percentage. We do see pulse establishment at individual sites, but the pattern here is consistent. And then secondly, we found that most of the Douglas fir actually occurred since about 1970. So 70% you know, of the establishment across this region is established and we see proliferation and continued establishment of Douglas fir into these oak stands. Okay, so that was just sort of a general overview of some work that we've done previously. And now I wanna focus on um, work that's just coming out. We have a new paper that came out in Forest um, Ecology and Management and a couple other uh, new papers that are coming out from this one particular site um, in Northern California that I showed the map of the sampling design. So in, or, in order to sort of, you know, think about the context of the lack of fire or putting fire back into the landscape and to, to address uh, encroachment, uh, we also have to think about other disturbances. And so California had, as you probably are well aware, a record uh, drought. And in Northern California, the this serious or um, extreme drought conditions occurred from 2013 through 2015. Uh, uh, and so we're, we're extremely severe um, and affecting vast areas, including Oak Woodlands ecosystems. So this set up, um, uh, a question in which how is encroachment and drought affecting oaks uh, and pure oak stands and then in encroached oak stands. So Jill Beckman finished her thesis, in which we have a recent paper that came out, where we evaluated tree growth um, in oaks and Douglas fir from pre-drought compared to during the drought and also pre-drought after the resident drought. And due to the sampling time period, we really only have one what I'll call resilience year after the drought. So I'm gonna share some of the results from this. And in addition to this, we also looked at physiological um, components at this site, which I think I'll be able to, to highlight pending time. Okay, so again, the question is, uh, what's the interaction of drought and uh, the response of oaks and Douglas fir independently? And then how does encroachment on oaks uh, impact that relationship. So the first set of graphs, I'm just looking at oaks versus Douglas fir and how resistant were they to the drought. So uh, just a little bit about the, the graphics where I'm using a tree growth, a basal area increment, and um, we're looking at resistance and resilience metrics based on the Lorette paper. So this graph shows drought resistance. A 1.0 would mean that the 
the um, drought resistance growth is the same as it was in the pre-drought period. And that pre-drought period is uh, 2012 through, or excuse me, 10, 2010 through 2012. And these are the drought years, 2013, 2014, 2015. So I'm going to show two different sets of graphs here. The green represents oak and the orange represents Douglas fir. What we found is that oaks were not surprisingly uh, relatively resistant to uh, drought. And so 1.0 again would be representing growth metrics that are similar to pre-drought. Um, and what we found is that Douglas fir, in fact, especially during prolonged drought, 14 and 15, the most severe drought years, were, we saw declining growth. And interestingly, although we only have one year of uh, post-drought, uh, what we found is that oaks uh, did quite well, rebounded, uh, whereas Douglas fir um, did not. So different strategies of dealing with drought and oaks seem to be very resistant, which is you know, not that surprising, but important information. So the second component of this question was to evaluate, well, how does encroachment impact oak resistance to drought? Well, what we found is that when we compared oaks, so growth in oaks that were only in oak stands and versus oaks that were in Douglas fir encroached stands, we found a difference, um, important difference in drought resistance. And so this graph represents that for each of these drought years, 2013, 2014, and 2015, that we see you know, roughly 20% uh, greater drought resistance when oaks are in oak only stands um, compared to when they're in Douglas fir encroached stands. So it suggests that uh, the above ground light, which we would expect is important, um, but it doesn't necessarily tell us if below ground uh, water is a factor as well. So um, Lucy Kurhulis, who's a professor also in, at HSU, and Gabe Goff, who finished his master's thesis, looked at some physio tree physiological data at this site and looked at a couple different things. So I think I have time to highlight uh, some of the work, which um, supports our work from tree growth. So um, this graph is representing uh, a stomatal conductance and the uh, uh, high values represent high gas exchange and low gas exchange for over a hundred um, white oak trees. And then the graph, we have low encroachment uh, represented the light green or uh, open conditions, moderate and then heavy encroachment. And what they found is that, uh, that in the heavy, encroached stands with high amounts of Douglas fir has the lowest gas exchange. Um, and this suggests that it's likely due to light limitation because they also sampled water status, which was actually the highest in the heavy uh, encroached stands. So suggesting that water wasn't the main factor. Okay, and so to support that, um, also they did some interesting work which where they were looking at basically where were the trees getting their water? So this is looking at both Douglas fir and oaks and looking at xylem water, the isotopic signature of xylem water during the dry season, so August is this example. Um, and uh, uh, these are paired neighbor trees and looking at to see you know, where are um, oaks versus Douglas fir uh, accessing their water? And in summary, um, oaks appear to be accessing a deeper water source uh, that's not necessarily available to Douglas fir, supporting that really light is more of a limitation uh, for oaks in encroached stands than Douglas fir. Do I have two minutes, Joe? Or, okay, I'm, I'm wrapping up. Okay, Great. so quickly, um, I'm gonna summarize just a little bit about some of our uh, recent work that I just presented. First, oaks are more resistant to drought, maybe not surprising, but it is very important, but the complication of encroachment is impacting drought uh, oak resistance. And so that's important to understand and to support uh, management actions like thinning and prescribed fire. Second, we, I didn't present this, but when we look at climate variables versus competition, competition seems to be having a more important role on growth than um, climate. And in support of the growth data, the tree physiology data 
shows that there are contrasting effects of conifer competition on oak versus oak to oak competition. And this uh, relates to light availability, supporting again, uh, the importance of uh, maintaining uh, active management, uh, pending those caveats that I mentioned before to open up stands across these oak woodlands. And with that, just wanna thank the funding sources and again, acknowledge the collaborators that have been part of the work that I just described. And I'm good, Joe. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I had the good pleasure of working in Southern Oregon in uh, management in White Oak early in my career. And um, this made me really miss it, uh, your presentation so much. So I welcome questions. We have about 30 seconds um, and people can type those in. Um, also, I, I will use this as an opportunity to remind everyone that we're going to continue this discussion. And so questions you didn't have a chance to submit or um, comments and uh, just further input, please join us for the related fire circle, uh, which, happen, which will start in 20 minutes. And you will access that through the HOVA agenda. Okay, so with that, I think we'll, we'll close this session and I just thank all of our presenters um, so much. It was, it was really interesting and kind of fascinating to see this across the US and um, all of our attendees. And we look forward to seeing as, as many as who uh, show up in the fire circle. So, thank, thank you, you, Joe. I just have one quick announcement here. Uh, this session will be available in Whova, our conference app within two weeks after the con Congress. And up next, we do have two general sessions, four special sessions, and as Joe said, two fire, fire circle discussion sessions. Uh, to choose the one you'd like, just go over on your Whova app, uh, select agenda and use sessions to join. Um, to join the session offering Spanish and Portuguese interpretation, be sure to select the session titled Advances and Challenges for Indigenous Fire Stewardship. Thanks again to our speakers and enjoy the rest of our day. But our fire circle is the one you really should join. <laughs> Do that, do that. Thanks all, have a great day. Thank you all so much.